Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Society's 2021 Annual General Meeting. I'm Helen Wiseman, Society President, and it's my privilege to welcome you here this evening. First of all, thank you for making the time to join us. I can let you know that we have 368 members logged on, so we are quorous and good to go. It's a real pleasure to be chairing this meeting, albeit sadly we're meeting online once again because of the pandemic restrictions. We've put together what we hope is an informative couple of hours with plenty of opportunity to find out more about the society and ask questions. Hopefully, a, no a number of you will have attended some of the great Your Co-op conversations that we've held over the last week or so. These have allowed members to learn more about the society and, most importantly, contribute their views and comments and ask questions. We'll be reviewing how members felt about these and we'll look to build on the concept for the future. If I can make a few introductions, we have a somewhat reduced team here in our head office, given the need to take precautions around social distancing. In the room, we have Phil Ponsonby, the Society's Chief Executive, Edward Parker, the Society's Secretary, and Peter Dubois, our Group Chief Financial Officer. Waiting in the wings, we also have Matt Lane, a Director and Chair of the Remuneration Committee, and James Eels for my Young Cooperator Network. They'll both be presenting briefly during the meeting. And of course, we've been ably supported by a small team of technicians. Watching online will be your board of directors, members of the member engagement committee and the executive team. And finally, we would encourage those of you who use social media to tweet from today's event. You can use the hashtag, hashtag MidCountiesAGM. So I'll run through the agenda briefly so you're aware of what's coming up. We're to have a presentation from the Group Chief Executive on the Society's performance through the 2021 financial year. We've built in a lengthy question and answer session after this, and we'll then have a brief update from the Young Cooperators Network, followed by some more formal matters, a approval of last year's AGM minutes, the appointment of our new auditors, adopting the report and accounts, a set of distributions and a review of the remuneration report. This will be followed by a special meeting to propose two rule changes. We'll have another opportunity for questions ahead of the voting, which we plan to do all in one go. And we'll wrap up with any other business and are aiming to finish at 8.30. With all that covered, we can move to the meeting itself. And I'll pass over to Phil shortly, who will be presenting the year in review update. Before I hand over to Phil, I wanted to share a few thoughts on the year. It feels fitting whilst we're all together that we should acknowledge the impacts of the last year and the real sense of loss that we have felt. We've all been touched by those missed moments, those lost opportunities in our lives. Some we will make up for in the weeks and months ahead. Others will remain lost as the moment has passed. And then there are the personal losses of loved ones that many of us have sadly faced. And we extend our thoughts and sympathies to families, friends, colleagues, and our wider community of members in their loss. I would ask our members to please join with me now in a moment of reflection. Thank you. We can move on with the meeting now. We have a short video highlighting some of the society's activity over the last year. I hope that you'll enjoy this and afterwards we'll go straight to Phil for his presentation.
Thank you, Helen, and good evening, members. 2020 um, was a one-off year. I think um, COVID-19 has had a profound effect on individuals, communities, businesses, and governments across the world. The shock to the world economy was three times worse than the 2018 financial crash. And so a really difficult year, and it's in that context that we report the numbers this evening. And in the UK, the government spent £300 billion in fiscal support, an unprecedented package of remedies to help businesses through grants, job retention scheme, and also investment in the NHS. And despite this investment, 17,500 high street outlets closed permanently in that time, partly due to an acceleration of online retail spending, which was up by 34 per cent, or 145 billion. We've seen over 800,000 job losses in the year. And the human impact of the crisis is more, no better amply reflected than the distribution of food bank parcels by the Trussell Trust, who distributed two and a half million food uh, parcels last year, and that includes a million uh, to children. And of course, with all this going on at the same time, um, Brexit was being completed, and as a business, you know, that was something we were very aware of right to the end of the year, uh, as we were dealing with that and through mitigations. So in a moment, I'm going to talk to you about the numbers, and when I do, I'll reflect on that in terms of the impacts that uh, coronavirus has had on the society over the course of that year. But before I get into the numbers, I would like to talk about our colleagues. As CEO, I'm privileged to work amongst 8,000 truly wonderful people. Uh, last year, at the height of the pandemic, we had nearly 2,000 of our colleagues furloughed, predominantly across our childcare and travel businesses. And we had 1,000 colleagues self-isolating or shielding, uh, and we employed a thousand temporary workers to help, particularly in our food business. I can't tell you how proud I am of Claire Moore and our HR team and how they worked to support our businesses in this, these areas, making sure that our colleagues were supported, that we updated our policies and provided support seven days a week. People like Dawn Stokes at our Banbury Funeral Services, who had to adapt, along with all of her colleagues, to our ways of working and ensure that she could meet clients virtually or over the telephone, you know, which is completely against her human senses and something that she's worked for for many, many years. People like Franca Giampa, who joined us at Cane's Cross Food Store after her business that she'd run for six years went bust as a result of the pandemic, joined us as one of our 1,000 temporary workers, and I'm delighted to say is one of the 250 that are now staying with us on a full-time basis. People like uh, Debbie Johnson from Blockswitch Travel, who when her store, uh, branch closed, decided to go and work in one of our food stores to help out. People like Tracy Rundall, who runs our Swindon childcare nursery business at the Swindon hospital site, who kept the nursery open throughout to ensure that our key NHS workers at that hospital could provide childcare for their children, despite the obvious heightened risks that posed to her and her colleagues. And people like Jean White at Stevenson Post Office, who last year completed 50 years service with the society. And I was privileged to join Jean at her celebration, albeit virtually. Now, Jean's one of nearly 800 colleagues who celebrated over 8,000 uh, years of long service last year. And they really are a tremendous group of people, and we are really proud to have them as part of the organisation. And it's important that we continue to support our colleagues. And I think when you see the report from Matt on the Remuneration Committee, you'll see how we supported them financially last year. But it's also important that we support them in other ways as well. We've worked with our partner, Grocery Aid, brilliant partner who helps support our colleagues uh, through their um, help desk um, and other means as well, also with organisations like Mind. And indeed, we're delighted to be working with an organisation called Every Mind at Work. And next month, we will launch a brand new app for our colleagues de dedicated to their well-being. Last year, we conducted our first ever well-being survey. We continue to talk to them through pulse surveys. And whilst all this was going on, they completed an incredible 27,000 hours of community volunteering. So a really incredible feat. And as one of those 8,000 colleagues, I just want to finish this part by thanking Helen uh, and our board of directors, because as colleagues, we are in this business day in, day out. And you know, as you know as members, our board are elected by you. Many of them have other full-time jobs or full-time commitments. And yet last year, they gave us a tremendous amount of time and support through special meetings, briefing sessions, working with us to make decisions very fast so that we could react to what was going on there. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Helen on behalf of our colleagues. So I'm now going to cover the numbers, as I said I would, um, and I'm going to start with the gross sales. Now, as I said at the start, we, we are an organisation that operates in many different sectors and probably best placed 
uh, the many to really understand the full impacts across different sectors that COVID-19 has created. And as you can see from the chart, uh, like with many of the co-ops up and down the land, our food business had a strong year, over £60 million increase on the previous year. Uh, but whilst our food business had a £60 million increase, our travel business had a £445 million decrease on the year before. So you can see that significant impact from that business and, and indeed our childcare nursery business also suffering as a result of the enforced closures uh, and parents being unable to, to um, bring their children to the nursery. So overall, a net impact on the society of over £400 million in terms of gross sales on the previous year. And of course that sales decrease finds its way into profitability. Um, but despite that, I am pleased to say that we have recorded a profit before significant items and share of profit distribution of £14 million. Not as high as last year in terms of the continuing operations, uh, which was £18.6 million, but still, I think, a credible performance. And again, when you look at that by our different businesses, you can see the varying impact that COVID-19 has had on operations. So the food business, £12 million higher on profit year on year, whilst our childcare and travel business combined was £17 million lower than the previous year. And that's the significant impact we've seen. And I would ask you to bear in mind uh, that in, you know, in addition to the job retention scheme funding we received from government, we spent £7 million in our childcare and travel businesses during the period of lockdown, keeping colleagues at work and also topping up pay to those colleagues that were furloughed. We also spent a further £5 million on pe um, personal protective equipment, also installing things like screens and uh, barriers and other safety measures within our food store. So significant cost um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and then just looking at the EBITDA performance, which is obviously the cash generated by our businesses, that's very much following the same pattern as the profitability. So, you know, a gap of around £4 million against the previous year. And of course, it was really important for us to be really careful um, with our cash last year and preserve it. You know, as a result of what happened in travel, we've processed over £130 million worth of refunds through our travel business. Um, that's resulted in net working capital outflow uh, for the society of around £23 million last year. We were able to mitigate that to some degree through the sale of our non-strategic assets, which was a planned disposal programme that we had already embarked upon, and that was able to mitigate that. But also being careful in terms of our capital expenditure, which meant that we held off a number of the projects we were going to um, create last year uh, into this year, and you'll see that as I go through the, the various details. So. Um, what impact has that had on our balance sheet? Well, actually, as you can see, year on year, not a significant movement in our net assets. What I should tell you here is that we've restated the January uh, 2020 numbers, and that's as a result of a changing accounting policy uh, around our funeral bonds and the, the way that they're held on our balance sheet. Um, this is a result of a, a regulatory intervention uh, with one of the larger players in the funeral market, one of the big, big operators um, who were were required to restate the way they account for funeral bonds. So in, in accordance with our new auditors, we took the decision to do the same and restate the way we account for them. And that's had a, uh, a, an impact on uh, both last year and this year following that restatement. It, it's actually a positive impact on the net asset position. And then just looking at some of the numbers, you'll see the fixed asset reduction there. That's as a result of those planned uh, disposal of the non-strategic assets that I mentioned, some of the older um, properties that we have, some residential properties and the pharmacies that we disposed of. Um, and you'll also see a movement uh, in current liabilities, a reduction in current liabilities. And that's as a result of that outflow in travel uh, and that reduced liability and that uh, working capital outflow. And then finally, just on the pension liability, because I know that many members are, are looking at that, you can see that's uh, not a significant movement. Uh, year on year, what we did do last year was increase the contribution we make annually to the pension fund from six and a half million to seven million pounds a year, and that was a, a contribution agreed with the trustees on an ongoing basis. So what that means for our net debt actually is a pleasing position because despite all the challenges we've had, we've actually been able to hold our net debt at a level position with the previous year. We, we didn't uh, need to take uh, advantage of any of the government loan schemes. Uh, and that's really as a result of the aforementioned reduction uh, in some of those non-strategic assets, being prudent with our cash, making sure that we were careful in terms of where we spent our money, uh, particularly with that working capital 
outflow. And I think that's an important position for us, and we are pleased to say that um, the way we measure that debt as a as a um, net debt to EBITDA ratio is well within the covenants, covenants we agree with our banking partners. Uh, in fact, it's comfortably within, and so that's a good position. And importantly, um, it means that we maintain a positive relationship with those banking partners. Um, we've worked with them throughout the year to ensure that we have cash flow headroom. Um, at the start of the year, we wanted to reduce the overall facility we have with our um, banks, and I'm pleased to say that we've reduced that from around 117 million, which is sort of our overdraft um, at the start of last year, to 109 million pound at the start of this year. But in agreement with the banks, we've now fixed that for a two-year period, and that's because we just want to make sure we've got coverage for any unforeseen or further shocks that might occur as a result of the pandemic. Now we're all hopeful that we're on the road to normal, but we did want to ensure that we had plenty of headroom in there as far as working capital, and I'm pleased to say that agreement's been made. Um, and the reason that the banks are uh, pleased with our performance and continuing to support us in the way they do is around the stability the society has now reached. And you will recall, those of you that attended the previous AGMs, that stability was a really important thing for us to work for, and that's why the board took the decision to exit the energy business as it was, um, because that was the, the, you know, the, the big issue that we were facing and the volatility that we were facing as an organisation. And I think you can see how that's illustrated by this chart. When I talk about profit uh, in the year just gone to 14 million compared with 18 million the previous year. That's because we have re removed from our numbers the, pre the old energy business because it's a discontinued operation. If we plug that business back into our five-year view, what you see from this chart is actually last year was a better performance in terms of profitability than the previous four years as a result of that energy decision. So that stability that we've now created is really important for the society. And indeed, our forecast for this year expect to see an increase on that £14 million number. So, so that is definitely the, the direction the board wants us to go in, and I'm sure members welcome that position. So if you have any questions on the financial numbers, Peter Dubois is here, our Chief Financial Officer, and be delighted to answer those in more detail. But I'm just going to highlight some of the major achievements from our businesses. I'll start with food. Um, you know, a really challenging year for food last year. Rupert Newman, our Chief Retail Officer, did a fantastic job with his team to navigate us through a very difficult year, £60 million increase in trade, you know, having to work in socially distanced environments, very difficult. A real big change in the pattern of sales. Um, uh, average baskets or average spends were up by a third. Transactions were down by a fifth, um, so a real shift. We also had to meet some challenges within the supply chain around product availability, and we did that by working with new local suppliers, people like Olden's Butchers in Oxfordshire, um, also the Patisserie Box, who we brought in, you know, who saw 90% of their business erode sort of overnight as a result of the pandemic. So actually, we were able to work with new local suppliers and help bring those through. Um, so great work by the uh, local suppliers team, and I'm delighted to hear this week that Nikki Wilde and that works in that team has been promoted to head of direct sourcing and so she's done a fantastic job very passionate member of our team and great to see her promoted as a result of her efforts last year and in our post office we completed over five million transactions they were very busy at christmas lots of people posting gifts and parcels as you can imagine i think the um also important to recognise that we opened uh, a new food market at Botley in Oxfordshire and a convenience store in Bedfordshire, welcoming new colleagues such as Az Khan, there you can see in the photo. Uh, and the standout performance for me is the delivery of over 100,000 parcels of food to our members in your communities that needed it most, members that were shielding, that couldn't get access to online deliveries and needed us at a time uh, um, when we were able to support them. People like Bruce Harris, who had a delivery on his 100th birthday. Um, so to go from scratch to that kind of volume of deliveries was an incredible feat by the team. And um, you know, Mark Taylor, who heads up operations in food, did a brilliant job in ensuring that that was done in a, in a way that only we could probably do, I, would, I think it's fair to say. Um, I mentioned Botley uh, and a store in Bedfordshire. We are embarking on a programme of new store development. Um, we have 28 confirmed sites. We've actually already opened three this year, including Sutton Coalfield, which opened last week. Um, we've got another three to open in the next two months, and we've got a further 59 that we're progressing. So a real investment by the board on your behalf to open new sites across our geographical region for the future. Um, and when we talk about new sites, and I mentioned Botley, I think what's important to recognise, these are not just food stores. These are stores that are playing an important role in their communities, and I see that very much as an increasing uh, part of what they do, uh, and they are wedded to their communities in an integral part. Uh, and here's a, just a short film on Botley just to explain that uh, in a bit more detail.
think a great example of our new format food stores and what we're going to see more of in the future. Uh, and talking about the future and growing areas, our childcare business um, is a wonderful business, the most colourful business we have, lots of cartoon characters and lots of colours. Um, but last year, as I've already said, it had a very challenging year. You know, parents were prevented from putting children into our nurseries as part of the restrictions unless they were key workers. And that resulted in two thirds of our nurseries being closed during the first lockdown. We did keep the third open for key workers, um, but it meant that our overall revenues were 22% down on the previous year. Um, what we were able to do, though, is adapt um, because we had to adapt. You know, it's impossible to socially distance when you've got a baby or as a toddler, as I'm sure you can imagine. But our team did brilliant work in terms of making sure that we kept our most precious customers safe uh, in our nurseries and when they were open, and certainly as they came out of lockdown. They also adapted to ensure that parents could, new parents could still visit the nurseries, albeit virtually through virtual showrounds. And 3,000 parents visited our nurseries virtually last year, and already 1,000 have visited our nurseries this year. So tremendous effort by Sally Bonner and the team to accommodate these new working relationships and uh, new, new ways of working. Um, and now, you know, as I said, most of our parents couldn't put their children into nurseries during the first lockdown. The contracts we had with our parents meant that we could, if we wanted to, charge them fees still. Um, we didn't think that was right. I'm sure you would agree that as members that it wouldn't be right to charge parents in that scenario. So we didn't charge fees, which is why the revenue is down as much as it is. And I think our parents responded well to that. We asked them to contribute towards a fund to help the key workers pay their fees. And we managed to raise £40,000 in doing that, which I think was a tremendous, tremendous achievement. Uh, and as I said, with all of our businesses, we've had to protect our colleagues. And they consumed over 2 million uh, items of PPE in our nursery business last year and continue to do so. And we will continue to support them. And our childcare nursery business is another growing area for the society. Um, you know, we, we continue to invest in our nurseries, making sure that they can uh, grow. We've got uh, 12 new sites confirmed, um, as well as 15 in progress. Um, just Cheltenham Park in uh, Cheltenham, uh, you'll be <laughs> unsurprised to hear, um, which opens in September. Uh, also Emerson Green, which we've just started work on. You can see the digger with a few of us around it, um, which started work last week. Uh, and importantly, you know, a new site in Bicester, which has just been signed off and subject to planning, which will be the first site that we'll open, which will be entirely designed and built by ourselves to a whole new specification. And I think it will um, be a beacon for childcare nurseries in the UK. It will have the latest technology and environmental specifications um, built into it. And so we're going to be uh, uh, creating some new assets for our members and our generations to come, and that'll be one of those in the future. So really positive outlook for our childcare business. Our pharmacy business did a tremendous job last year. You know, many of our GP surgeries, surgeries were closed, as you know, and so our pharmacies were open for business and there to help people in their time of need. Uh, they dispensed over 2 million prescriptions. Um, and whilst all this was going on, you know, we adapted our online site, added new items such as masks and sanitizer, added advice areas on there. But of course, as you will know from the AGM last year, we had made the strategic decision and the board had decided um, to exit the high street pharmacies. And so that work was going on during all this time. And so I'd just like to pay tribute to the professionalism of all of our colleagues working in our high street pharmacies. You know, they've continued to serve our customers whilst we were transferring them to um, new community independent pharmacists. And most of the, or all of the pharmacies have gone across to independent pharmacists. And the last one actually goes across last week. And I'm delighted to say uh, that that site in Chipping Norton is going to our pharmacy manager, who's actually going to be buying that pharmacy from us, Yasin. He's a wonderful, wonderful man, and uh, he'll do a brilliant job. And uh, I think it's great that we've been able to do that and retain our colleagues in those businesses whilst we've done it. So um, great work, and, and you know, big thanks to um, uh, Adrian Wilkinson, who was our COO for our pharmacy business, who led, left at the end of the year to join another operation. And when I'm talking about businesses uh, developing uh, and adapting, our funeral business did so in earnest. Um, you know, they were obviously busier than we had planned, 9% increase in funerals last year, which is 7,000 funerals overall. Um, services were cut back, you know, limousines, you know, number of mourners that could attend. So they had to adapt. As I've already said, the offices were closed and they were arranging behind closed doors. But, you know, in only the way they can, they adapted. They were very professional. Um, they delivered a brilliant job. And I know Mark Adams, and his team, you know, have dedicated themselves to doing the right thing by clients. They lost one of our beloved colleagues last year, and we miss him badly. Um, but, you know, the way they adapted was tremendous, you know, creating an online uh, service so that mourners could join virtually at the same time, and many other areas as well. And, um, you know, I'm really proud of the work they did. 
As I've said already, the travel business um, saw the biggest impact overall, a 90% fall in sales year on year. A third of the bookings transferred into this year, over £130 million pounds refund, refunded back to customers. Um, Radsa Vonagenovic did a brilliant job with her team in terms of manning a new virtual call centre handling over 75,000 calls. We wanted to make sure that you, our members and customers, could contact a real person if you wanted to amend your booking or you were concerned about your booking. And they handled uh, over 100,000 uh, rebooks and amendments as part of that process. And I think they did a brilliant job. And most of the branches, or all the branches, were closed for at least half of last year. Our travel business is an important business to us. Um, the board are committed to its long term. You know, whilst it's had a difficult year, we still see it as an important business for members. You know, uh, apart from a few operations in the east of England and Lincolnshire, we are the only cooperative now operating a travel business, and that's following the transfer of the Central England uh, travel branches from Central England to us last year as part of that consolidation. And um, we also took on seven branches from Carrick, who are a high-quality travel operation that we feel we can learn from. Um, we've re refreshed our website because clearly you know, um, making sure technology works better in the future is going to be an important part. So we've invested in our website, but there's a long lot further to go in that respect. Um, and we've also maintained a really positive relationship with our personal travel agents, 160 home workers who are self-employed who suffered in the same way as we did last year, along with our consortium members who we work closely with, including Blue Bay Travel that's now headed up by Alison Rowland, who was our chief retail officer, uh, who left last year to become the CEO there. And we wish him well. I'm sure he's listening tonight. And it's great that he stayed as part of our setup, as, uh, heading up one of our consortium members. Alice has been replaced by Sarah Dunham, who's joined us uh, 12 weeks ago as our new chief retail officer. And I know that Sarah's uh, already hit the ground running and is getting her teeth into uh, many of the things we want to do with our travel business for the future. Um, and so when I talk about people getting their teeth into the business, hitting the ground running, we also welcomed Lizzie here in last year as a new COO for our utilities business. Lizzie has combined the energy partnership with Octopus, with the phone co-op, our flexible benefits business into this new utilities operation. It's had a good year despite the challenges. It made a profit, which is a really good uh, tick, just under a million pounds profit collectively. Um, but actually what's really important is that, that Lizzie and the team there are focusing on the really important things, things that matter to you, developing our community power arrangements. We've now got 100 community power uh, partnerships with people like Ripple, which is the first crowdfunded wind farm, people like Westmill, who have now created a, a dividend through the scheme if you sign up to the, our community energy tariff. Um, in the phone co-op, working to um, in, introduce new partners, people like the World Wide Fund of the Environment, you know, who share our values. And whilst all this has been going on, also working hard to do their bit in the community um, you know, donating 100 tablets to schools to help them keep connected. Um, the service in our energy business was, was reflected by citizens' advice um, by naming us in the top five for service quality. And a lot of new, exciting developments, particularly in areas like electric vehicle charging, a salary sacrifice scheme, which a number of our colleagues have already taken up. So a lot of work in the utilities area, and we're delighted with the work that Lizzie and her team have done. And I hope that throughout all of our businesses, you've seen a reoccurring theme about sustainability, um, because that's really important to us. And, you, and you know, we may have been excused last year if we'd, you know, put some of this on ice or on a back burner because of what was going on. We haven't quite the opposite. In fact, we were recognised by um, the Eddy Media uh, Organisation as a business of the year for our, um, our working communities and our sustainability credentials. Um, and we're going to do more. Um, I was delighted last week to see that the co-opted group are following our lead and replacing their single-use plastics with compostable carrier bags, something we did last year, saving 8 million plastic bags. Um, we now recycle 99% of our waste across our operations, but we're going to continue to do more. We've just announced that all of our new company cars will be um, electric or hybrid vehicles. All of our vans used in our business will be electric vehicles in the future, and there's a lot more to be done here. And Pete Westall and his team are doing brilliant work, not just here locally, but across the UK, but also internationally. And, co and Pete represents us um, both in Europe and amongst the international co-op community um, to really push the agenda in these areas. And I know that's really important to you. It is the biggest challenge the world has in terms of climate. We recognize that. 
um, and it's something that we will continue to do more and more towards. And as part of our sustainability, you know, we recognise the importance to work with communities and the importance of community infrastructure and viability. Um, that's why we continue to support our charity partners, why we help to raise them through the Restart Fund and give them support in this area. Um, you know, the fact that a thousand members and community volunteers got involved in our home deliveries and food is an incredible, incredible achievement uh, and great work done there. Um, you know, £50,000 raised to support our food banks, 70 food bank partners, because, you know, they couldn't necessarily collect donations from stores at the height of the pandemic. And so we will continue to make that commitment. I know a number of our uh, community partners are watching tonight. Thank you for your commitment and your work with us. And we're here by your side and we'll continue to be so. And I know that's a really important part of, of what the board wants to ensure for the long term. And I'm going to finish with you, our members, as I've done previously. Um, you know, we have over 700,000 members. Last year, as Helen said, we hosted our first ever um, online AGM. We're doing it again this year. Hopefully, we've made some improvements. We did the half year that way. We've continued to engage with you. Over 36,000 members engaged with us last year through a range of virtual events. You know, brilliant work by Tara and the team and the Yorkop conversations. I joined quite a lot of them. They were fantastic events. You know, really engaging. And, and if you get the chance to join them in the future, please please do. Um, we're going to continue to develop our, how we engage our members and how we work with you. Um, in the summer, we'll be launching a brand new members app. We have an app at the moment. It doesn't do what we really want to do. We're going to be launching a brand new one. I know some of you have already downloaded it to get your share of profits digitally. Some of you have been involved in the pilot we launched last August, so thank you. Um, but there's actually quite a lot more to come, and I'm not going to tell you now because I think our new Chief Marketing Officer, Alison Bain, will probably shoot me uh, for giving the game away, and she's got to talk to the board about it yet anyway. But um, there's more to come. You know, now, when you think about it today, uh, less than 10% of our members trade with more than one of our businesses. Now, that's a huge opportunity, and we see this new app as a way of engaging members and giving them re more reasons to do it. But also, it's about a younger generation. You're going to hear from James Earls in a minute from our young corporate ne network. James keeps telling us, you've got to get better with the tech. You're behind the times. Improve it, uh, along with his colleagues. And, and he's right, and we're going to do that. Uh, and you'll see that as we launch this new technology. But the commitment the board wants us to make to you, and I think it's a really important commitment, is that we will engage with members however you want to engage with us. We will not replace the current engagement with new technology. We will enhance it with it. And I think that's well and truly uh, uh, amplified by the way we worked to support you, our members, uh, through this last year. People like Mary Langdown, who was our 100,000th member to receive uh, a home delivery. Sorry, our 100,000th home delivery, not 100,000th member. Um, home delivery. Uh, she picked up the phone. She told us what she wanted. We dropped it around to her house, and she was delighted. And we will never lose sight of the importance of that kind of relationship with our members. Um, so thank you for listening. I hope you found that helpful. And uh, over to you, Helen. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. So thanks, Phil. You've covered a lot of ground, um, in which I'm sure members will have found helpful. From the board's perspective, we truly value our executive team and and operational management teams in the way that they responded so positively with a number one focus on colleague and member safety but all the time working for the society for a sustainable future i'd also echo what you've said about our amazing colleagues and also our willing band of member volunteers who've done so much to support our communities throughout it's been a very challenging year for all and we've done our best to keep cooperation alive and despite the very immediate issues to look ahead the board continues to work with management on longer term strategy and we're in a much more stable position financially to grow the society over the coming years. We now have the opportunity for questions from members on any items from Phil's presentation. We'll do our best to cover off as many as we can in the time we have available and your questions will be relayed to a screen in front of me. I can see them coming through now, so I'll be taking them from there. And those we don't have time to answer we'll respond to in a consolidated way in the next few weeks. First of all, though, we've received a number of questions submitted by members in advance of the meeting, and I'll cover off a couple here now, and the rest will ensure that we answer specifically or consolidated response. The first is from Christopher Ridges, who asked why we haven't returned the government funding we received, as some of the other supermarkets have done, and whether that means we're taking, we are risking the high ethical standards we set ourselves. So you've heard from Phil this evening that our results have been very severely impacted by the pandemic. 
Whilst it is the case that our food stores have done, done well, it's also the case that we're not just a supermarket operator. And you'll have seen in our results that the additional boost to our food business has been more than offset, in fact, far more than offset, by the difficulties our other businesses have faced, particularly our childcare, but especially our travel business. We basically shut down our travel business for a large proportion of the year, and for a period, two thirds of our nurseries were closed. So we've used the government's support in the way in which it was intended, in effect, to protect our colleagues' jobs. We appreciate some other businesses have fared much better than ourselves over the last year, but we believe it's for the individual businesses to take a view on the government grants. We've also received a number of questions from members in relation to the recent share of profits distribution, which we have distributed digitally this year. Most of these are making the point that we need to make sure we cater for members who don't have access to a smartphone phone or the internet, and some are querying the general rationale. So I'll quickly cover these points. We did give options for members to choose how they receive their share of profits. So members who didn't have internet, internet access have still been able to get their vouchers. But feedback and hindsight is telling us that we didn't make these options nearly clear enough. So it's something that we, that we will address for next year. And on the general rationale, there are two key points. First, we have saved a lot of paper. We used 29 tonnes of paper for the 2018-19 share of profits distribution. We're, we're, this has fallen to five tonnes now, and that's a real positive contribution. And second, we were also conscious that less than half the members who used their share of profits voucher actually spent the vouchers they received. So we wanted to provide additional options to let more members benefit in a way that suited them. And ultimately, we are crediting members' share accounts if they don't take an option so they don't lose out. That means that instead of 90,000 members benefiting last time, all 215,000 members have benefited this time. With those two covered, we can turn to live questions now. And the first question I have is from Scott. Scott's asking about our flexible benefits. Are we still operating as a trading division? Thanks, Scott. We've uh, consolidated the flexible benefits operation in with um, you, uh, the utilities set up under Lizzie Heron. And the reason we've done that is because in the past, our flexible benefits business has been um, pretty much reliant on the business of, of providing childcare vouchers um, through the government tax scheme. And of course, that's been ended by the government. So we needed to find a new source of revenue for our flexible benefits. And we felt um, that was going to come from working through salary sacrifice schemes in providing electric vehicles um, to people and to businesses, uh, and also in areas such as cycle to work and those sorts of areas, and uh, you know, or electric bikes. Uh, and so we felt that by putting it as part of the utilities team, they'd be best placed to drive that forward. Uh, I'm delighted to say they've already launched a pilot of the electric vehicle salary sacrifice scheme. A number of our colleagues have taken advantage of it here as part of that pilot. And um, you know, we're expecting to see a sort of a rollout of that um, proposition over the uh, course of this year and into next year. And I think that provides an exciting opportunity for that business. We work with you know, quite a few uh, organizations, and I think most of them that we've spoken to already uh, have shown an interest in, uh, in EV salary sacrifice schemes. And so that's why we've put it in the utility. So yes, it still exists is the answer, but it was part of that wider group. Thanks, Phil. And Callum's asked about the pharmacy business and how we see it sustaining itself now we're moving to a purely online service. Um, and, you know, will we be able to justify keeping that business with the customers that we have? Yeah, I mean, we're doing a lot of work on it. And Rupert uh, Newman, who looks after our food business, also looks after our online pharmacy business. And Rupert joined us, um, having had many years' experience in food retail with Sainsbury's, but also having had experience at Lloyd's Pharmacy. Um, so he's well placed to look at this for us. Um, I think we'll, we, you know, the, the board have got some work to do in terms of the strategic planning for it. Um, if we look at it just as a transactional business, um, then you wonder what its future is. But I think one of the things we started to do, we did this last year, was campaigning. And so we, you know, we've been calling on the government to remove VAT on sunscreen, for example. We took the VAT off the sunscreen. Well, in fact, we pay it because we've still got to pay the VAT. Um, and we do feel that our um, our healthcare business um, has a role to play in terms of campaigning and raising uh, issues, um, but also um, working through our retail business to provide a more flexible approach to pharmacy. So, you know, pop-ups in food stores, helping people perhaps access things such as flu jabs and so on. Um, so there's a lot of areas that we're exploring, no, nothing to reveal tonight. But, um, you know, I think um, in, in, with the right 
investment in time and effort, then um, there's a good opportunity there. And of course, we you know we were um, surprised to see the Colt Group exit their online pharmacy business earlier this year, um, having invested quite a lot of money there. That means, in effect, that we are the only um, online cooperative healthcare business now, and that obviously opens up some other opportunities as well. So a uh, bit of work to do there, but um, yeah, we're certainly uh, uh, working on it. Okay, so I'm going to lead into the question from Christopher. It's about about the percentage of members that only trade with one of our businesses. That's that's a ten percent figure. Yeah, exactly. And you know, when you consider we've got seven hundred thousand members, um, uh, and and you know those that are actively trading with us all the time um, are either trading in just food or trading in just. Uh, utilities or just trading in travel um, and we've recognized this opportunity to connect um, them through our businesses and that's about the consistency of how we communicate to members it's also about developing technologies so for example if you're a member that lives you know by one of our food stores and uses our food store but you, you're nowhere near one of our travel branches it's quite hard right now for you to have a quality with us by improving our website and making it much easier to use that digital service it means you can shop in our food store and then use our our website for travel and we're going to give you more and more reasons to do that and that's part of the planning so it's a big target area for us it's something that uh, certainly when I was appointed by the board was pointed out to me as a big target area um, I've had a few distractions in the last couple of years but it, it's absolutely where we believe we can make bigger in inroads and we're already seeing an increase bit by bit in our member participation numbers now this year and that's positive um, over last year but I think we've got a long way to go but it's a big opportunity yeah Okay, so David has asked about octopus, the octopus energy has shown a loss in the last year, and how does this affect us? It doesn't affect us in terms of a, financially because we, you know, our partnership with Octopus uh, is not based on a profit share or anything like that. It's a direct payment by them to us on a fixed amount, and so it doesn't affect us at all financially. And in terms of Octopus and their investment, I mean, they're growing very fast. I mean, the, you know, Octopus Energy is part of a bigger setup backed by a very strong uh, Octopus investment who have a very strong balance sheet. They've recently won investment from uh, a number of new investors as well. And so, uh, and they're also, they have a separate technology element, which is actually their platform they develop for energy, which is getting a lot of traction. They're selling that into uh, Australia and UK businesses as well. So they're seeing income streams from lots of different areas of the energy business itself is is producing a loss as ours was because of what's going on in the sector around you know, cost versus pricing, um, also the position on debt and whether you can recover debt positions and so on. But that's part of their growth plan, so it's not something we're concerned by, but it doesn't affect us on a financial basis. And it was really you know, very pleasing to see the growth in the, um, the joint venture in the community energy um, and the PPAs there. So you know, yeah. that's something I know that members will look forward to seeing more of in the coming years. Um, interesting question from John about what kind of projects are financed from members' development shares? Well, all, because we're not ring-fencing uh, member development uh, investments, so it, it's to support all of our growth areas, and that's really important because I think that's what members would expect. You know, we're not saying you're just investing in this, um, and so it supports all of our um, projects to some extent. Okay, excellent. Um, we question from another member about how quickly we expect the travel business to return to at least break even. I would, I'm, I'd probably need to touch a big piece of wood here, but actually our, <laughs> um, our forecasts are that we expect that to be this year. Um, you know, we, I, I, we've seen some incredible business through our travel business in the last uh, month. Um, Sarah Dunham was telling me, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we, we put, you know, a lot of people are booking UK with us, um, particularly seacations, as they're calling them, these cruises around the, around the UK. Um, and Sarah was telling me a couple of weeks ago that on the day we launched the Disney cruise, um, within two hours, we'd sold 200 cruises through our travel business, which is tremendous. So, you know, actually, the last couple of weeks, the travel business of, uh, sorry, last week and the week before that, um, they've shown increases over the, tw over the 2019 number, um, which is positive. But it's difficult. You know, we shouldn't, you know, shy away from that. It's hard for people to work out whether they can book. And so we're not banking on a lot of business for this summer. It might come, but actually where we're putting a lot of focus is on UK destinations, actually bookings for 2022, late uh, summer bookings, and September's been the busiest month so far. So we're all hoping that things return to normal. Um, but yes, the forecast is that it will return to um, break even this year. That's great. 
So Geeta's asked about what learning from the pandemic will we take forward for staff and customers working in different ways? I think um, a number of areas, actually. The, the role we play in communities is, has been a real learning. I think, you know, I, I've, some of the letters I've received from people that said I was told to shield and I was told to go online and order my groceries and I tried to and I couldn't get a delivery slot or I was rejected by the online supermarket um, and I contacted my co-op and they dropped the shopping off for me and it just it really did re-emphasize the role we can play in our communities and I think that's something we have to take forward um, we have to do a lot more work around I know there's some work being done and we're talking about some of the projects we've got around how we can help our members in our communities more than we do today so I think that's one way I think also agility our ability to change fast at a pace, um, whether that's through technological advancement or just in the way we do things, you know, all working from home and, you know, we, we close all of our um, our office buildings and all of our colleagues have to work from home and, and it's worked. Um, so those types of things as well. But so, yeah, I think, uh, and I think also the importance of, you know, climate, environment, sustainability, for me, it, it reinforces it, it's amplified the whole thing. Um, and therefore, you know, digital, green, agile future is what we've learned about uh, uh, from that, I think. Thanks, Phil. So um, we've got a couple of specific questions from members around sort of um, food stores and one from Jeff about where he lives. There's no mid-county shop that's near to him. Um, and there, ever, there is, however, a Heart of England co-op just up the road. Is there any ongoing or future plans to liaise or work with other uh, co-ops around the UK so we can use our discounts in those stores? Yeah, and this, this this is a reoccurring theme, and it's a frustration for members up and down the land. I mean, I think there's a million co-op group members that don't have access to a co-op group store. Um, you know, so we have recipro reciprocal arrangements with uh, a number of the regional societies. Um, it would be nice if we could have those arrangements with all. Um, that's on me and, you know, the CEOs <coughs> through the auspices of the FRTS, which is the Federal Retail Trading Services Board, which we all sit on, including the CEO of the co-op group. That's on us to really get our heads around that and make that work in the future because it's been a frustration for members and it, it's a frustration for us as well. Okay. Um, and there's a question from Christine, um, which has just disappeared off my screen. So if we can bring that back, if not, I'll move on to another one and come back to that one. So a question from Sean around um, sitting with... He said, I remember sitting with you in our Carterton store not long after you joined the society, and I thought you had a really clear vision on what our food business should look like. How much has that changed um, over, the, over that time? And in, last year in particular, has that changed it? The area has changed, I think, and, and Rupert's doing a lot of work with this, and I've got some sessions with the food team in June, um, is I, I think we, we, we talked about that time that we've got to be relevant in our location, we've got to be relevant to our members. There's, there's no point us trying to be all things to all people um, and then failing, and therefore we want to be able to provide a service in food to all of our members, regardless of you know demographic, background, um, a working state and so on, but it's got to be relevant, and therefore developing the right formats is important. We've developed, a, you know, a really successful format, which is our food markets. We've just opened Botley, as I said last year, and we've got more to come, more investment in that area. We took on the four Budgeon supermarkets that all been converted to food market. They're being very successful for us. So, we, and, you know, Chipping Norton, but we know that that format works, and that's really important. We also have a very um, successful convenience format that stood a society in good stead. You know, the, the neighbourhood smaller stores uh, but one of the areas that we're working hard at is how do the, those stores evolve in the future because you know with the, the likes of Amazon now offering same day delivery on groceries and everyone else jumping on the uh, on the home delivery online bandwagon and what does that mean for our convenience stores and uh, how do we evolve them into something that's relevant in their location and I think that's about increasing the services increasing the the things that they do for their communities um, as well as selling great food so that's probably the area that you know has enhanced our thinking last year and i mentioned this point about our role in communities but overall no it's that it's that we're, we're in the same place in terms of the plan um, and the you now i talked about some of the divestments on non-strategic assets that's because we were able to look at our food business work out which of our stores were for the long term which perhaps weren't and we're working with those sites to either redevelop them into formats 
parts that are or to do other things with those sites. So that's pretty much still on track as a plan. But the community bit is the bit that I think we want to do more with. And I think you're going to see some exciting developments in that area yeah. um, in, in, in the coming, coming months. Fab. And, and I know as a board we spend a lot of time looking at the strategic overview of, of each individual business and certainly spent a lot of time looking at food um, and you know what the future might bring. So that's really good to hear. So I go back to Christine's point, which is, you know, from Christine's experience that stores are closing, um, that standards drop um, and that customers perhaps are not getting um, the right prices being charged and charged for items are not purchased. And that the advice they're given then is to talk to the manager. That doesn't seem to take impact. What can we do to improve that, Phil? Well, that, that's disappointing to hear, Christine, obviously, because whilst, you know, we have um, some stores which, as I said, are not identified for the long term. Um, we have spent a lot of money uh, in, in the last year on upgrading refrigeration, fixing things that were broken, and we continue to do so. Um, and I'm, you know, I think it's fair to say that the managers had a really difficult year last year in maintaining standards because of what was going on with the pandemic. And that may be some of the reason for what you've seen, but maybe it's not. And uh, I don't know if this is based on one particular store, but you know, what I would say to you is if you're not getting a, the right response uh, from the manager, drop me an email, uh, phil.ponsonby at midcounties.coop, and I'll send that out. You know, let, let me know and I'll pass it on to Rupert and he'll get... He'll make sure that we look at that in, in detail for you. Thanks, Phil. Right, I'm conscious of time, and I've got questions coming through. I've got to ask one more in this section and try and pick some up later. So from Christopher, accepting, he says, they accept that Osney Lock Hydro is a significant project, but when we departed the energy business, it was said there would be a team developing further innovations and ideas in the energy business. How is this developing? I'm worried that it might slip away without anybody noticing. I'd be very disappointed, Chris, if we did. I mean, we, you know, as I said, Lizzie uh, has arrived uh, as our new um, chief operating officer. Um, you know, Lizzie comes from an energy background. She was at Ecotricity. She was at a solar power uh, organisation where she was MD. She is very creative. Um, she's got some good people working with her, people like Tom Hoynes, who heads up our joint venture with Octopus and Community Energy. Tom's been able to sign up. Uh, a number of new power purchase agreements. We've just hit the 100 mark, and I think it was 75 last year. I think that shows that we're expanding those arrangements. The work we've done with Westmill in terms of creating the uh, trading dividend, the work we've done with Ripple, as I mentioned. Um, but, you know, there are new technologies emerging, battery storage, solar, um, and... Right now, I think Lizzie's got more plans than we've got money to give her. Um, that's our challenge, it's certainly the board's challenge. Um, but no, we're, we're certainly not, um, it's not going to slip away. Um, it, we see it as a really important area. You know, for nothing else, the climate change elements and the work we can do to create proper sustainable energy sources um, is, is really important and, uh, and we're committed to that. Thanks, Phil. OK, so I now need to move on. Thank you, members, but do keep those questions coming in using the question box. So I'm now pleased to introduce you to our Young Cooperators Network Coordinator, James Eels. James will be giving us a quick update on the Young Cooperators Network, which has developed over the past few years, and we hope will provide a platform for young people to learn more about cooperation and become involved in the society. From the board's perspective, it's really great to see our young cooperators getting more involved and ensuring their voice is heard. Over to you, James. Thank you, Helen. Good evening, everybody. My name's James Eels, and I'm the Young Cooperators Network Coordinator for the Society. I'm going to take this opportunity to discuss with you what the Young Cooperators is about and all of the work that we've been doing. I'll start off by giving you a bit of background information on how the focus of young members came to light. In 2018, we created the Young Member Network with the help of our interns and graduates. And the aims of this was to increase the number of engaged members, both economically and democratically, in this targeted age bracket. The Young Cooperators Network was created in 2019. I was working on this from day one and then joined the team permanently in February this year. Since doing that, we've, we've seen the network grow from strength to strength. This included increases in active and engaged members via our social media channels, increased democratic activity and much more. The aim of this network is that we want the voices of our young cooperators to be heard and recognise that they do matter. We want them to influence and inform the decisions that we make within the society 
and ultimately inspiring them and others to be engaged. The platform allows young members to share opinions, take part in discussions and make recommendations to the strategies of the society that really affect young people. We're aiming for increased democratic involvement, making it more meaningful to our young members. So what I'll do now is show you a short video highlighting what the Young Cooperators Network does. So as you all just seen from that short video, we are running the first ever youth election campaign for three seats on our member engagement committee. We'll be running this alongside the society's elections and we'll be working closely with the governance team to ensure that we meet all requirements and the standards that we currently hold. Having young people on the member engagement committee can bring a wide variety of benefits. A few of these are raising awareness to young people that they have the opportunity to stand for election. They bring fresh and ideas and insights to the committee. And it, most importantly, it provides young members an equal voice and ensures that young people feel recognised and their ideas and voices can influence what the society does in future. We'll be releasing more information about how you can get involved in your Young Cooperators election campaign. So keep an eye out on our social media channels and our website. Finally, if you want to be involved or know someone who does, you can scan the QR code on screen now or visit our website at www.midcounties.coop. And finally, if you have any questions about anything you've seen or heard today, please do email us at ycn at midcounties.coop. Thanks, James. And it's great to hear of the enthusiasm, passion and the growth of the Young Cooperators Network. This now takes us to the, the more formal part of the meeting, the minutes from last year, the appointment of auditors, the adoption of our annual report and accounts, our proposed distributions and the remuneration report. We'll also be holding a short special meeting to cover two proposed rule changes, and there'll be another opportunity to questions before we move to vote on all of these items in one go. And we think that's the best way to work the agenda, given that we're all online. It seemed to work well at last year's AGM. And so to the minutes. We have the minutes from last year's AGM to approve. Hopefully you've seen these on the website. If you have questions to ask, then type away. 
We've also updated for, uploaded for information the draft minutes from the half-year meetings and the special meeting last October. As no doubt some of you will have attended these meetings, we will be approving these minutes at the half-year meetings in the autumn. We'll also be asking you to ratify the appointment of our new auditors, BDO, and to approve their appointment for the year ahead. Last year, we undertook a selection process to find a new auditor. Our previous auditors, KPMG, had been auditors for the Society for well over 20 years, so best practice required them to step aside, leaving us to undertake a selection process to find a new firm. We had a short list of three, PwC, Grant Thornton and BDO, and are pleased to have chosen BDO, who have the necessary depth of experience to cover all our varied business. Normally, we'd have our, law, our auditor, Laurie Hannett, here with us at the meeting, because in light of current restrictions, uh, she won't be in attendance. However, she is standing by, so can I answer any audit-related questions you may wish to raise? We then move to the approval of the annual report and accounts, which we, will, which we then come to voting, we'll be asking you to adopt. We've heard a lot from Phil earlier in the meeting, but if you have further questions or need to ask something on the detail in the document, then please ask. And finally, we move to the, the approval of distributions. Our next formal agenda item is the approval of our distributions, and Peter Dubois, our Group Chief Financial Officer, will present the details to you. Peter. Good evening, members. It's my pleasure to present your board's recommended uh, distributions uh, this evening. So I'll run through the details of those uh, shortly. Uh, and then if you have any questions, please submit them in the usual way. However, with the impact of COVID-19 being more prolonged th than anticipated, your board is mindful that the final impact is uh, still unknown. And with this in mind, it has taken the decision to defer the recommendation of the share of profits distribution until later in the year at the Society's half yearly meetings. This will still afford the opportunity to make the distribution within the traditional timescales subject to your approval. And this is in line with the approach that we took uh, that was taken last year as well. So now on to the distributions. So we'll be considering six elements of uh, distribution this evening. Firstly, the membership uh, development. This is the support provided to develop membership and to allow members to effectively engage with the society. The community support, the funding of support in our communities. Developing young people. The cooperative uh, development uh, fund where we can support the promotion of the cooperative model. Uh, the campaigns fund, and finally the colleague uh, dividend. So the first uh, component is the membership uh, development. And the membership development supports all of the uh, activities that we use to engage uh, with our membership, uh, in including the production and distribution of uh, uh, membership, uh, the provision of uh, general meetings such as uh, this evening, both uh, physically uh, and uh, online at the moment, and those uh, running costs. So the total gross distribution of that is 795,000, but with uh, a small amount of unspent funds from the previous year, the amount to be approved this evening is 786,000. The next uh, element is that of uh, community support. As you can see, we've, uh, the, the breakdown of that expenditure for approval tonight is 266,000. And this is a really important area of uh, support for our membership. It supports over 100 uh, charities, including uh, the mine charity that Phil referred to uh, earlier. And we're also anticipating the relaunch of the full programme uh, from September, pandemic permitting. The next area is that of uh, developing young people. 
So we heard uh, from James a little earlier, very eloquently telling uh, us how important the Young Cooperators Network is and how it encourages young people's engagement with your society. This is really important as it uh, helps the development of tomorrow's cooperators, something that's important to all of us. And within the education environment, we have supported younger people with uh, online access and other support, both throughout the pandemic and looking forward into the year ahead. And uh, the proposed uh, distribution that requires approval this evening is for £92,000. Another key area is how we can help the cooperative uh, model um, be developed uh, uh, through, throughout uh, the U UK and more particularly uh, in our area. And how do we do this? With um, affiliated or, or, or close uh, or organisations that are very uh, closely uh, affiliated with the cooperative movement, such as Cooperative Futures, that helps the development of uh, co-ops. Uh, Cooperatives UK, the apex body uh, for, for uh, co-ops uh, in the UK. Uh, the International Cooperative Alliance, with a, a wider uh, reach, uh, that, that represents uh, cooperative organisations and members in over 110 uh, countries and gives an effective voice to over 1 billion uh, members. So the distribution for approval this evening is, uh, is £200,000. The next area for consideration is the Campaigns Fund. And members will recall that the Campaigns Fund is open to applications from any political organisation active in the society's core trading area whose aims are sympathetic to that of the society. I should point out that in the meeting papers that you have seen, the society's uh, campaign's annual report is available. This short report outlines the activities of the fund during the past year. Organisations can apply for support through an open application uh, process, and the next round of applications will open in September uh, 2021. And the distribution uh, for this year for the Campaigns Fund is £60,000. The final component uh, that we'll be seeking approval for this evening is the colleague uh, dividend. Members will know it's been our practice to make a distribution to colleague members to recognise their contribution to mid-counties. The recommendation for this year is a uh, dividend of £450,000. The actual amount colleagues receive is based on their average hours worked and their length of service. For simplicity, a colleague with over two years service and working over 30 hours uh, per week on average will receive um, approximately £60 each and you'll be uh, asked to approve this uh, shortly. So in summary, the total value of uh, distributions that uh, we're uh, requesting your approval for this evening, members, is £1,854,000. Have the opportunity uh, to vote on that slightly later. Thank you, Peter. And I can remind members that they can ask questions on any elements of, uh, of the areas we're covering now in the question box. We now move to the Society's remuneration report. As part of good governance, it's appropriate that members have the opportunity to endorse the Society's remuneration report, which you can find in the annual report and accounts on pages 54 to 71. The report covers the remuneration policies and practices for the Society's directors and its executive management team. Matt Lane is the chair of the Remuneration Committee, and it's appropriate he makes a few remarks, so I'll hand over to him. Thanks, Helen. Good evening, members. It's my pleasure to introduce the remuneration report to you all. The first thing I should say is that the report is very detailed. It follows the best practice disclosure requirements set out by the government. We think that's the right approach, to be as open and transparent as possible on what we know can be a sensitive subject. 
The primary role of the remuneration committee is to make sure that the society's remuneration policy for the executive team is fair and equitable in light of our cooperative values and principles. For the last couple of years, the Remuneration Committee has also had a broader, high-level oversight role on the reward and pay of colleagues across the whole society. I believe we're now beginning to see the benefits of that new joined-up approach, and I hope you'll see that reflected in the report. On executive pay, if I just summarise how the policy translates into practice. In essence, we pay salaries around the median level, but the bonus and other incentive arrangements are significantly less than found amongst our competitors. So overall, the pay they receive is also significantly less. You'll see this summarised on the slide, and you'll also find it in detail in the report itself. In the report, we've made reference to the pandemic and how we've tried to find the right way to respond in relation to pay and reward. I'd like to quickly pull out some of the key actions we've taken. The executive and members of the board took a voluntary 10% pay cut last summer for a three month period. The chief executive took a 20% pay cut until October and both the board and executive waived their annual pay rise. Members of the executive who had earned long term incentive plan payments agreed to a two year deferred payment and those who had earned annual bonus for 2019 all agreed to waive their payments. For the part of colleagues there are a few things that I'd like to draw your attention to. The Society topped up furlough pay from 80% to 100% until the 1st of July last year and continued to, thereafter to pay furlough pay above the government's set rate. We also paid a 10% bonus on hours worked to frontline colleagues for a period last spring and summer and we have made bonus payments to frontline managers to recognise a very difficult year even though the bonus scheme has not paid out given our reduced profit performance. Finally, and more broadly, we also increased the hourly rate of pay for our lowest paid colleagues by 7.4% over the year as we look to outpace the rises being brought in by the government on a national living wage. I hope you'll agree some very cooperative responses to what has been a very unique and challenging year. We have had one pre-submitted question relating to the remuneration reports from Mr Reinhard Huss around pay ratios between the highest and lowest paid within the society. It's a question we often get, so I'm happy to uh, answer it again this year. Uh, I'll cover it off now. We can actually report on this, and we actually report on this in a remuneration report. It's the top chart on page 59 of the reports and accounts. You'll see that pre-tax the pay ratio was 31 times. Post-tax that comes down to 19 times. You'll also see, see how our competitors are placed on the chart. The pay ratio among a peer group of our competitors is 59 times pre-tax pay and 37 times for, for post-tax pay. So in broad terms, the pay ratio is about half of that found in our PLC competitors. It's important to also note the direction of travel. In 2017-18, our pay ratio was 28 times after tax. In 2018-19, it was 23 times. and 2019-20, it was 20 times. This year, as I said, our pay ratio between the highest and lowest paid colleagues was 19 times after tax. So down from 28 times to 19 times in three years. I hope you'll agree that's an encouraging trend. I'm happy to answer any further questions later in the meeting. Back to you for now, Helen. Thanks, Matt. And finally, this brings us to the special meeting where your board wishes to propose two rule changes to members. I'll hand over to Edward Parker, the Society's Secretary, who will explain these to you. Uh, good evening, members, and thank you, Helen. Yes, as Helen's mentioned, we've two rule changes the board wishes to propose to you this evening. Um, you might have had the opportunity to review them in the paper that's in your AGM pack, but for those who've not, I'll briefly describe uh, what's being proposed and uh, then you'll have the opportunity to ask questions and vote on them uh, shortly. Uh, you can see on the slide here that um, both rule changes concern um, Rule 10, as it happens, uh, and the first one, Rule 10.1, uh, Arrangements for Contested Elections. And I'll just step back here and say that this is simply not an issue for us at the moment. So this is contested elections for our board of directors. In the 18 years I've been with the society, we've always had a contested election for the board. Uh, and then in the last five years, the average number of candidates standing for board elections has been 14 for the five or six vacancies available. So that's a very healthy position that we're in, which is right as it and as it should be given uh, we're a corrupt society where the democratic underpin is so important, of course. But the board looks ahead. It may be, you know, that down the line this uh, healthy position erodes. So 
we thought hard about what we should do in that kind of situation and the board wishes to add some I guess you could call them preventative measures to the rule book uh, that lets us know what we should do in circumstances where it seems that our healthy democratic position is perhaps eroding. Uh, the board is also mindful of the governance code that has recently been updated by Cooperatives UK. Um, that sets out in a slightly different way uh, a solution to the same issue, really, that's to, to ensure that there are always well-contested elections with good quality directors putting them, uh, coming forward and being elected to the board. So what the board wants to do and propose to add into Rule 10.1 to ensure we do have uh, good, healthy elections uh, and to prevent them uh, sort of from that from becoming moribund uh, is a rule that says if I might just read this actually because it's probably right that you have the right wording. So here we go. If over two successive elections, the average number of candidates is less than one and a half times the number of vacancies. Uh, and that's a pretty high bar still, if you think about it. Um, then the following measures shall be taken prior to the next election. The board shall, excuse the page, page turning, encourage members attending the next annual general meeting to stand for election, contact other active members by letter and email to encourage them to stand for election. That's uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and ensure that anyone who expresses an interest in standing for election, uh, ensure that they are offered information, support and encouragement to stand. So if it will take those steps. If they then don't work, the rule change goes on. If at the next election, the measures above do not take the number of candidates to more than one and a half times the number of vacancies, then prior to the subsequent election, the board shall repeat the above measures and in addition, shall take active steps to encourage nominations from individuals within the cooperative movement who have a demonstrable cooperative commitment and experience and who also fulfill the eligibility criteria that we have in the society. Then again, moving on, should insufficient candidates put themselves forward for election following the election set out above, the board will conduct surveys to understand what barriers there might be to becoming a director and take, and this is the important part, and take action accordingly in time for the next election. So that's proposed, as I say, it's a preventative measure. I think it makes a lot of sense. We're in a healthy place now, and it'll just ensure that we stay in a healthy place going forward. Uh, the second, um, rule change that the board wishes to propose to you concerns rule 10.7 little briefer to explain so this is uh, the number of years a director can serve as president if you quickly read the rule 10.7 you'll conclude that it's six consecutive years but actually then if you step back and think about it um, what could happen uh, if the board wishes it is that a director could serve as president for six years have a break for a year so for another six years have a break for a year so for another six years and so on and so on and so on which is not good governance and the board recognizes that so we're just seeking to clarify uh, the arrangements we think are appropriate for the society and again i'll just read here so uh, the board is hoping you'll approve a rule change that will then read a director can serve as president for a maximum of six years in any rolling 12-year period Hopefully that was a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but to explain the changes to you. Back to you, Chair. Thanks, Edward. So we now have the chance for questions on all the above items that we've been through. The minutes, the auditors, the annual reports and accounts, the distributions, the remuneration report and the rule changes. It'll be the same process as before. We'll answer what questions we have time for and provide answers on those we don't in the next few weeks. Um, and so to the questions. Um, I've got a question here from Scott about how the distributions are calculated, for example, the community grants. And I'm going to ask Peter to, to step up and we'll cover off any dis distributions questions with you, Peter. OK, thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, so uh, there is a formula that we uh, apply uh, uh, and we, we've had that in place for uh, a number of years and it looks at the level of uh, profits uh, that the society uh, has made and it has a, a target level of sustainable distributions uh, that, that can be made. And of that total distribution pot, there's a, an allocation to each of the various uh, component uh, parts. I hope that uh, answers your question. Thanks, Peter. And there's a follow-on question, really, which is from Scott as well, about colleague div dividend. Um, and I guess probably also to cover this off, um, colleague, Scott asks, can colleague dividend be increased given the dedicated service colleagues have given at such a difficult time as during COVID? Um, I think if um, we go back to Matt's report, um, Matt outlined the additional support that the society gave to colleagues during the COVID, which included uh, a 10% uplift for frontline workers um, and uh, additional benefits. So those are all included in, in Matt's report. 
but the you know in line with what Peter said this is a sort of an ongoing annual distribution um, and the society took extra steps during COVID to address those concerns. Um, we've got another question from Barbara um, and it's why are you not has it moved? Why are you not covered by the financial compensation scheme? It's quite disconcerting when you invest a large amount of savings to support the co-op and they're feeling vulnerable with your investment. I feel I'll come to you and then Peter. Yeah, I mean, I'll let Peter answer the technical point because my understanding is that cooperatives are not covered by the financial compensation scheme, which is set up for financial services institutions. Um, so cooperatives have different rules and set. Um, and I think, you know, as, as I explained as I was going through the numbers, that's about, you know, the strength of our, our balance sheets, our ongoing businesses, which are very strong. Uh, and it's important for members to always look at that in terms of when they make investments, as we all do when we invest in our society in that way. And I think that's the important thing. But I'd just let Peter um, answer from a technical point just to, to clarify that in terms of... Yeah, the you, you, you've covered it very well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Phil. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're not a financial institution and therefore not regulated. Uh, by the uh, Financial Conduct uh, Authority, uh, and that's why, why it's not covered. But uh, as you rightly say, we're a very strong uh, society. We've got um, a strong property uh, portfolio that, that gives, uh, gives uh, strength uh, to the society, and, and uh, in, in that way, uh, members can have uh, confidence, but clearly you need uh, all, all members make their own personal decisions on that. Thanks, Peter. So, and I can see we've still got some few questions hanging over from our earlier question session, so I'll ask, that, I'll ask those as well. Um, John asked about the benefit of, of uniform branding across co-op operations. Um, nevertheless, is there a case for making it clearer which society runs what? Yeah, I think it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because you know, it, obviously we have operations now, um, particularly in travel, um, childcare nurseries, the utilities, the online healthcare, where we're pretty much the only cooperative society operating in that area. So it's easier in that respect. There's less confusion because, you know, we're the co-op that operates those businesses. I think where the confusion uh, continues clearly is in food, because whilst there are different colour uh, fascias and signs above the stores, we all work together in food. And the co-op group obviously manage a good proportion of our food supply and distribution and... Um, products and therefore when you're inside the store you're, you're buying the same products and that creates confusion so I think it's important that we can identify uh, within the store that we are the mid-counties cooperative even though that we're trading under a unifying co-op operation um, I think the the new app will help do that as well um, because the more members that we get the more that they'll understand which co-op they're doing business with and I think that's really important um, so yes, I think it's it's we want to benefit from the um, the wider, you know, excellent UK cooperative um, societies um, and the and the understanding of those. But equally, uh, make sure people do understand uh, which business they're they're shopping with. So always more to do there. Thanks, Phil. I'm going to come to our society secretary next to answer the question um, posed by Pat. For a number of years, the MEC has not had sufficient candidates. Does the proposed rule change apply? And if not, what is happening in relation to this committee? Well, just in relation directly to the MEC, the board this year have decided, and this will be coming forward, I don't think this is a great secret really, for the next election, to introduce a young member constituency onto the MEC. So that'll have three young members on it. And um, so the committee doesn't become too unwieldy. Also, just to knock back by one position, the number of for want of a better term, I might get into trouble here, regular members on the committee, so to nine. So we're hoping with those um, uh, changes that we'll be able to um, encourage more candidates to stand. I mean, the key thing is that we get candidates coming forward. I think we probably will have plenty of young members coming forward and hopefully we'll have some more, again, careful, regular members um, putting themselves forward for election to the MEC. Thanks, Edward. And, and I'm sure that the very successful your co-op conversations that we've had will have encouraged people to stand either for MEC and board. Um, and there were, you know, lots of people joined us, particularly on uh, the Meet the Board and MEC sessions. So I'm hoping those are people who may be interested going forward. 
Um, the next question is around training that we offer to members who wish to stand for election. And Edward has disappeared, but he can make a re reappearance. Um, I can say from our perspective, obviously, we offer um, in encouragement to members who wish to stand by the way of a candidates forum, which they, you know, they are required to attend. So we can give candidates information about what it is um, and what we expect of them. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Edward to talk about the, the training that we offer. So if you're elected, we have a pretty full induction program um, that gets just teased through and changed each year. But broadly, uh, first of all, you get a whopping great big induction pack. There's a lot of stuff to read, a lot to absorb. Um, you get the opportunity to meet members of the executive uh, one by one, just to understand and learn their businesses. Uh, we give the opportunity and urge you actually to go up to Manchester, where uh, the sort of heart of cooperation to visit Cooperatives UK, the apex body of uh, cooperatives around the UK. Also the Rochdale Pioneers Museum, which is where cooperation began back in Rochdale. The, the museum itself is actually in the original house where the first shot was. And then um, there are courses available that uh, if you want to uh, uh, um, improve your knowledge in particular areas, there are courses available for directors that we can send you on as well. So it's, it's pretty comprehensive. It's tailored. You don't have to do a lot of this. Um, some directors do avail themselves of all the opportunities. Some don't, depending on how confident they feel and ready they are to contribute to uh, board discussions. But I, I think it's a good program yeah. and it seems to work well and we get reasonable feedback from our new colleagues on the board. Yeah. So members who are actually looking to stand for election to the board um, will find that we don't have a specific training programme, but members themselves, you know, we are all, as directors, we're all ordinary members. Um, and it's important that we have that diversity of members. Um, we have um, you know, members of the board who have... Uh, who have qualifications in all sorts of things, and we have members of the board who um, come along and are ordinary consumers, ordinary members who want to contribute to the board. So I think it's important that members uh, look through the documentation that's then understand what's required of them, attend the candidates forum. Um, and, you know, we'll offer what advice we can, but actually, in reality, it's about members deciding who they wish to represent them on the board. Um, so the training itself, as Edward has described, you know, will, will come into play when people um, do stand and do successful for the board. So we've got a few more questions. Um, uh, what guarantees have been obtained from the developers of the Headington site that the cooperative will be able to set up in the developed premises? Um, yes, and so for the benefits of uh, members perhaps uh, online that are unaware of the Headington site, this is one of our um, older supermarkets um, that we operate from in Headington. Um, and like some of these legacy stores, been affected by lots of new openings out of town. And so it's one of those uh, sites that we've been looking at how um, it, it fits with our requirements for the longer term. And so we've agreed a position with a developer who's acquired the site, it was our freehold, uh, and who will redevelop it with a, a mixed-use development. So there will be potentially a subject to planning and elements of residential uh, above a new food store on the ground, um, which will be smaller. Um, and, of course, we're working with that developer on that. We have um, the right to occupy that um, space if we choose to do so, and that will be a matter for the board to determine um, on the basis of the of the viability, but we've sought that right, and um, that's built into the agreement. Um, and therefore, you know, we very much hope that will be the outcome uh, when we get to you know, assuming that the uh, the planning goes. In the meantime, we continue to run the store, and we will continue to run the store, however, for however long that takes in terms of that um, that planning process. Thanks, Phil. And that includes the post office, by the way, which is in in the store as well, and uh, would be incorporated as part of that. That's, that's great news to hear. Um, we've got a question from Amanda around, um, could we consider moving the AGM by at least a week forward in time so the advanced sessions don't clash with local or national elections, please? Well, Amanda, I think we need to have a word with uh, Westminster and suggest they move their elections, because I think our AGM is far more important. But the um, the AGM is, is sort of, of set within a, a legal time frame from the end of our financial year. Um, and obviously, there's a whole range of steps that have to take place before we can hold the AGM. Um, so, you know, this year obviously was very different with the co-op conversations and we'll bear in mind your, your comments and, and see what we can do in future years about the timetable and making sure that members do find their sessions accessible. Um, so we have a lot of uh, question from Toby. A lot of work has gone into the new membership app and is really excited to see customers use it. How successful do you think it will be? 
It's going to be really successful, Tony. Really successful, um, and we've got a brilliant team working on it um, across all the different business areas of our business. Um, it's been, you know, a long time in the development. Um, we've piloted it, um, and then we've learned from that. We've had some great feedback from members, and just uh, last week, in terms of the your COP conversations, there was some great feedback. Uh, there as well. So we, we're building into it all of that learning and that feedback. Um, so it's going to be fantastic. Uh, and um, I've had it on my phone since last August, and um, I love using it when I go to my local store. I've been part of the pilot, one of the guinea pigs. But no, it, it, it's going to be great. Thanks, Phil. Um, and Anita asks about plans that, uh, to look at how we can make colleagues feel safer due to abuse from members of the public. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, that. I mean, this is generally um, an issue for our food stores, more so than other businesses, albeit um, we do get incidents from time to time with other businesses, but predominantly in our food business. And there's been a lot of work going on uh, in two key areas, really. One is what we do ourselves internally, and Rupert Newman has been working with his team to develop a, a new approach and some new ideas around uh, security equipment approaches, um, uh, and actually, um, their team are taking me through that tomorrow evening. Um, I'll be seeing it for the first time in terms of what they've come up with. So, some, But I know there's some really good work being done there to improve our investment in technology systems. We've already done a lot, and we've been trialling things such as headsets and new camera types and um, safer, safer mechanisms. But um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good, good stuff out there now that you can use to improve safety. And then the second area, which I think is, is a fundamental area, and I've been at this along with a number of other CEOs uh, up and down the land, not just co-op CEOs, but across all of the retail areas, um, is around getting the government to change legislation so that our frontline workers are given the same rights as uh, public officials are. You know, that the police are, that NHS people are, because they are providing a public service. They're being asked to uh, sell alcohol under a very clear set of rules and tobacco, et cetera, et cetera. And they deserve the same rights as people in those public uh, areas. And we've been campaigning for that. And indeed, just um, uh, last week, um, I wrote along with 32 CEOs from companies such as Tesco, ASDA, the Co op Group, other co ops, to the Prime Minister to make sure that the uh, police and crime um, bill that was announced in the Queen's speech this week does include protection for shop workers. And we, um, you know, um, we've been working hard on that um, with uh, a number of MPs uh, to get that done. And I think that's, that's a really fundamental part. So anything you can do as members to help support that cam, uh, campaign, please do. And of course, there's the Victims Bill as well, which has been announced by the government in the Queen's speech. And so again, we will be making sure that that extends to our workers. So two elements. One is campaigning, get the legislation to give you more protection. Two is uh, invest in our stores through new technologies and types of equipment. Thanks, Phil. And, and that's certainly an area that um, I know comes up quite a lot in our board discussions. Um, lots of board members obviously exceptionally interested. And I also know that we've been working closely with us or on campaigning on this. So there's a, a, a lot of activity going on and it's great to see because our colleagues certainly deserve that protection. And indeed, you know, and Rupert's coming with his team to the board in June to mm -hmm. talk through that, 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 that plan as well. So I mean, I know it's, a, it's, a, it's an important matter for the board. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. So a question from James about, is there any consideration of expanding to new counties in the Midlands, such as Herefordshire? Well, it, yes. I mean, Herefordshire, um, it's a neighbouring county, obviously, for our existing counties. I think there's a wealth of great food produced in Herefordshire. It's, it's you know, rich in, in terms of um, local produce and local products. And, of course, we are really keen to grow and expand our um, range of locally sourced foods, and therefore having a store or stores in Hereford would make Herefordshire would make absolute sense in that respect because it makes that easier for us. So um, I know the team are looking at a number of different locations and sites, and they're very active, as I said, in that pipeline of new stores. So um, if James, if you do know of any good sites, um, please do let me know or let the team know because um, yes, um, it would be a natural fit for us, I think, given where we already are. Great. Thank you. Um, so, question from Stephen. Um, I know Mid -counties, counties takes a lead on this, but can you share more about how Mid Counties trains all colleagues on the cooperative values and principles? 
Certainly. I mean, I think we've got more to do. Um, we do a lot of work here, and as you said, we take a lead. I think our does values uh, have been ingrained within our organisation for a number of years, and, and you know, it's one of the things we measure um, as part of our uh, surveys with colleagues. Do they understand our does values? Do they know what they mean? How do they relate to them? Um, these pulse surveys we've been running this year, constantly asking colleagues about their understanding. Um, but actually, you know, I know that um, the exec team, uh, along with the board, feel that we need to do even more. Um, because, you know, a number of our colleagues obviously um, stay with us for a relatively short period of time, particularly students um, or some of the overseas workers that come work with us. But we want to make sure every single colleague understands, you know, why we're different as a cooperative and what our values mean for us. And um, a number of the executive, Alison Bain, uh, who's our CMO, Pete Westall, Claire Moore, are all working on a new set of ways of communicating, training, developing them. So, yes, we, I think I agree we take the lead, but we want to do even more. And so um, I think the expectation is that in September the board will be um, working to sign off a, a new plan, a new communications plan, a new way of, uh, of expressing uh, how we do business and how we embed those values. And I think that will be shared with members later this year. That's, that's the plan as we sit here today, uh, as you know, Helen. So um, I, think, I think that's where we're going to see that, yeah. that big change. Thanks, Phil. And, and I've been very privileged to be able to go and visit the new sites at Bishop's Cleve and, and Lydney over the last couple of weeks. Um, and I, I met Becca at Bishop, Bishop's Cleve and, and Sam at Lydney, uh, the store managers there. Um, but I also met all the colleagues um, who were in the store at the time, and I've been so impressed by... Um, their enthusiasm and commitment and their understanding of what makes us different as a co-op and, and, and also, you know, the importance of engaging with members. Um, and these were new colleagues who've been with us for a short space of time. So it, it, whatever we're doing, it's obviously working well. So that's really good. Um, so we've got a question from Christopher about how we will be explaining the numerous outcomes of the recent round of online member forums to our large membership. And I think Christopher probably joined a few of these, so um, we'll be really interested to see what, what's, what's happening. Yeah, because I, I, I know that um, Pete, uh, Westall, Tara um, are really keen to make sure that we both learn from the York Art conversations um, uh, and also share the outputs. Because uh, I said I joined probably about half of them, um, and they were fantastic in terms of the richness of the conversation um, and the ideas that were coming forward from members, the questions. Uh, so we need to do more of it. Um, and I think, you know, we've been, I think we've been quite good at uh, developing our online panel with members. And over the last uh, few years, we've had a lot of research conducted with members, asking them about their opinions on things. I think a couple of years ago, we, we put a survey out for 9,000 members. Um, it's part of our uh, approach now, is, is making a much more a constant interaction. Um, but probably the bit we can do more is actually what the point you're making, which is how we share that outcome. And I think that's, that's, that's the big challenge for us. Um, and Christopher, you know, you have my commitment on behalf of the team that we will do that and um, we'll do, do our best to make sure that it is shared with everyone because I think it's, it's brilliant work, we really do. Okay. So Barb has asked about whether we can continue the online AGM in future years, having found it really helpful and, le and learnt a lot. So I suppose I'll answer this from my perspective and... Um, speaking for the board. Um, I think the online AGM has, has offered us many opportunities to engage with perhaps a wider group of people, a different group of people, um, and, you know, that's been fantastic. But for me, the member interaction that we get on our AGM um, is fantastic. The opportunity to go and have a chat, have a cup of tea with a member who wants to talk to you about something is something that I've really missed. And I'm looking forward to us developing a way where we can have both of those opportunities um, and engage with a wider range of members across the year. So um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Phil. I, I, I agree. I think, you know, I... I genuinely miss sitting down and talking to members over the coffee break or lunchtime and you get some real personal insights into how it feels to be a member, which you, you, you don't get in the same way online. That said, I think we've also got to reflect on um, you know, the new world and how we can make it easier for people to engage. And so I think as I was saying earlier, it, it's not about replacing one way with another way. It's about using all the ways to do it um, and making sure that everyone's got access, whether they want to through technology, where they want to turn up, and we want to encourage people to turn up. Um, and, you know, 
as I said, James Eels has been pushing us about technology. Um, I, I was really interested to, you know, to read about the Norwegian co-op that added 120,000 new members last year. 38% um, of them were under the age of 30 um, because of the way they're engaging using technology. So it, it's... It will be the board's decision in consultation <laughs> with the members. I, I think we've got to make sure we have lots yeah. of different ways of interacting and engaging with members in the future. Thanks, Phil. I agree. Um, there's a question here from Justin, and it's, is it time to consider merging with a neighbouring society? I could, I'll hand that one over to you, Phil, but I'll answer it as well. Um, no, I don't think so. I think, you know, as I said earlier, we, we clearly are running businesses such as childcare and travel, um, utilities, online health, which are unique businesses. So there's not a scale opportunity in those businesses. I think what is important, um, though, is that we, we enjoy really positive relationships with the regional societies. Um, we enjoy a positive relationship with a cooperative group. Um, they are our big supplier in food, and it's important. And uh, they've done brilliant work in the last few years in developing the food range, which we could never have done on our own, and that's really important. But I think, actually, there's a lot more opportunities to work more closely with our neighbouring societies. And if you think about what we did last year with travel, where Central England transferred their travel branches to us because they recognise that we can do a better job in travel because we're bigger in travel and it's where we can invest more. But their members are enjoying the same benefits from our travel business as our members are, and that's part of that agreement. So I think we can work more closely with neighbouring societies and use that uh, those synergies uh, to provide services to our members um, You know, and, and really think about which businesses we operate as societies in which they operate and rather than just trying to compete on businesses and I think that's an important opportunity but um, I, I don't think there's a need for merger because of the uniqueness you know you, you just listen to our members in the last couple of weeks and the richness of the ideas and the innovation and this society has, ha has had a history of innovation and you, you, you'd probably you'd lose some of that I think um, and that's my view um, and you know we couldn't fit them all in this office building anyway so I think that would be another challenge um, but no I think seriously the important thing is that we work close. I mean we do you know our neighbouring societies particularly central England that we enjoy a really good relationship now I know I've known the CEO there for a long time I, I came from southern so I know them very well um, so you know I think we've got good relations east of England as well um, and that's the important thing and we are doing a lot of work around how we can look at our businesses collectively uh, and work out what, where's the right thing to do. Th to, to, yeah, to, to and, and I, I agree. And I think my time in the movement, I've seen a lot of change about the way that societies do work together um, on cooperative matters. And I, and I think that's really important that we continue to develop that. And I think one of the areas that we, you know, we are really strong in and other societies work closely and, and, and are taking the lead in different areas. So that's really good that every society has its own campaigning forum, if you like. Um, but I think as a movement, um, we're all very strongly committed to sustainability, and I think this is something we can we can get together and, and have more joined up thinking on. Yeah. Um, I saw several questions coming through. Um, I'm going to actually move the the agenda forward to the vote because I'm conscious that the vote takes quite a lot of time, and I have to get through that um, from a point of view. So I'll move through to the vote, and then we've got some other questions which I'll try and cover under any other business. Okay. Um, so the great set of questions coming through, uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, so we can now move to voting on the items we've just covered. We've got a quick practice session first to bring everyone up to speed on how the voting system works, and then we'll move to the formal vote. Just as a reminder, only those who've been a member for at least six months are eligible to vote. Would you prefer to attend your AGM in person or online? You can vote now. And we're getting ready to close the vote. We will be closing the vote in three, two, one, now. And I can remind everybody, if you click on the results tab on the left of the screen, you'll be able to see the results of the vote. Hopefully that's been straightforward. Um, and hopefully um, I'll get the thumbs up to move on to the next vote. Um, Okay, so the first we move to the minutes. We'd like to approve the minutes. I formally propose the, the, on behalf of the board, the meeting approves the minutes from the 2020 AGM. Here's your slide. Please vote now.
That's great. I'm getting ready to close the vote. I'll be closing the vote in three, two, one, now. Thank you. We now turn to the appointment of our auditors, BDO, and we need to ratify the board's appointment of BDO as auditors for this last financial year and for the year ahead. This is a two-stage process, so first the vote to ratify BDO's appointment. Here's the slide. Please vote now. So I'm getting ready to close the vote. I'll be closing the vote in three, two, one, now. Thank you. Remind, again, you can see the results if you click on the results tab on the left of your screen. And so now to confirm the appointment of BDO for the year ahead. Here's the slide. Please vote now. And I'm getting to ready to close the vote and close the vote in three, two, one, now. Okay, thank you. So we can now move to the uh, annual report and accounts. And on behalf of the board, we are asking members to adopt the annual report and accounts for the year ending 23rd of January, 2021. Here's the slide, please vote now. It seems like a long time, but we are waiting for people's internet to catch up with us. And they're getting ready now to close the vote. We'll be closing the vote in three, two, one, now. So we turn now to the distributions. We're grouping our cooperative and membership distributions into one vote for ease, and we'll then vote on the campaigns fund and the colleague distribution separately. So I formally propose a distribution of 786,000 to fund the society's membership development, 266,000 to fund the community support activity, 92,000 for our work on developing young people, and 200,000 for cooperative development grants. So in total, 1,344,000. We can vote now. Okay. Don't forget, you can change right up until the vote closes. So I'll be closing the vote in three, two, one, now. Thank you. And finally, we move to the campaigns fund. I formally propose a distribution of 60,000 to fund the society's campaign fund. Here's the slide. Please vote now. So I'll be closing the vote in three, two, one, now. Thank you. So we come to our final distribution for the colleague dividend. I formally propose a distribution of 450,000 to the society's colleagues, which we plan to pay in July if passed. So here's the slide. Please vote now.
So I'm getting ready to close the vote in three, two, one, now. Thank you. And so to the remuneration report. As members, you have an advisory vote on the report. And so could I please ask you to cast your vote on the remuneration report? Here's the slide. We'll be click. You can vote now. So I'm getting ready to close the vote. Closing the vote in three, two, one, now. Thank you. And finally, you'd be delighted to know it's the last two votes on the proposed rule changes. So first of all, if I could ask you to please clash your vote on the rule change concerning the arrangements to contested elections. Here's the slide. Please vote now. I'm getting ready to close the vote. Three, two, one, now. Thank you. And now the rule change concerning the number of years a director can serve as president. Here's the slide. Please vote now. And I'm getting ready to close the vote. Three, two, one, now. Thank you. Thank you, members. You'll be delighted to say that's all the formal voting covered. Um, and uh, I'll ask Edward to confirm the results shortly. But whilst those have been collated through, um, we reach our final agenda items, any other business. If anybody has anything specific they wish to raise, um, I'll just give you a pause a little moment to ask you to type. Okay, so I'm going to come to some questions. Continue with questions whilst we're waiting for the technical um, matters to get resolved. Um, so Callum's asked about seeing that he sees a lot of retailers with really fun and engaging content, content on social media. Um, and he, Aldi for great, being a great example. Will you look to incorporate this style into your social media approach at all? I, I, th I think so, yes. I mean, it's, it's clearly, you know, the way that um, people like to engage now, particularly, um, I think, some of the younger generation. I mean, I, I watched with amusement the, uh, the uh, Cuthbert versus Colin debate on the Caterpillar cake. And what was brilliant about that was when Witch got hold of it and really looked at it, that they voted Charlie, the co-op Caterpillar, as the number one for quality and taste. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's a great thing to get involved in. And in that occasion, we probably should have been uh, pushing the, uh, the qualities of, uh, of Charlie, the Caterpillar cake, which is on sale in co-op stores um, against the others. But no, I think at a serious point, it's, it's important that we do embrace that. We are doing it in some ways. I think our childcare business in particular do a lot of this already, but I think it's in some of our other business areas that, that you know we will be doing more of this in the future. Thanks, Phil. So um, we've also got a question from um, Sharni. Will we be utilising more social media platforms in the future? I find it difficult to engage with and share good news about our business online when we aren't keeping up with the times with apps such as Instagram and TikTok. I would love to share more. Sharni, I think you need to tell me how to use TikTok. I really have no idea. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's the same as um, the last point, really. It's that, um, you know, we, we, we are doing a lot of stuff and there's, you know, particularly in through our utilities team and, um, you know, I know the young cooperators use Instagram. There's lots of social media platforms, but TikTok, and I know that our childcare team again have been using TikTok, but, you know, we've not probably had a, a, a really structured... Um, clear social media engagement plan, and I know it's something that um, Alison Bain is uh, looking at in, in a lot of detail with um, Pete Westall and the communications team. Um, and I must tell you, my daughter um, loaded a video up on TikTok um, of her being stupid with her friend. Um, she was contacted by an online retailer, I won't mention, who offered them £100 in vouchers if they could use their video in their advert online. and. They agreed and took it. So I understand how this thing works <laughs> to some extent, and uh, you know, it, it just shows that how how the world's changing, and we've got to we've got to be um, you know on board with that absolutely. Okay. Um, so, question from Louise about with the new normal coming as the country slowly opens up. What are our plans for colleagues working from home? Will this be allowed to continue if colleagues would like to do this? Yeah, and imagine that question, Louise, is 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 from a you know about colleagues working in our offices um, rather than in our you know front end operations where clearly you can't really work from home. But uh, in terms of our offices, I mean, interestingly, we had already introduced uh, what we call an agile working policy um, before the pandemic. So we had colleagues um, within this business already starting to work from home or in the office, particularly colleagues in. Um, IT and finance where we started it. So that made it easier when the pandemic hit because we had already set up some of the elements of doing that. But I think what we've learned in the last year is that you know, you can be much more dynamic in that. And uh, what we are looking at is a flexible approach to the future where, you know, depending on the colleague's role and what they do, and, and uh, uh, that there will be opportunities to mix and match in terms of whether you're based in an office or whether you're working from home, different times of the week, and, you know, whether you join meetings online or whether you're sat in a meeting room and, and there'll be um, various ways of doing it. So we're certainly not going to go back to the way we worked before, but equally, we're not closing down all the offices and telling everybody to work permanently from home. And I think that's the right approach. Thanks, Phil. Um, the question from Stephen, um, just downloaded the new app and agree with Phil that it's superb. Could mid-counties offer this to help other co-ops, perhaps through FRTS? Yeah, I mean, we, in terms of the spirit of sharing and to the extent we can, um, without upsetting the Competition Markets Authority, I mean, I think once we've got it, um, Properly launched, and what you're seeing at the moment is the is the sort of beta version. It's not the it's not what we will see as the main version. Um, that that'll be even better than what you're seeing, Stephen. But yes, um, there's no reason why we wouldn't want to. You know, if they if they were interested, help other societies, the regional societies. I think Co-op Group have done work in this area already, um, but certainly the regional societies, if they're interested in the future. Thanks, Phil. Um, I'll get an update in a minute on the technical issues on the voting, but we've got a couple of questions still to get through. Um, so Mark asked about, um, mentioned about food bank, and we'd mentioned Trussell Trust, um, and he's highlighted there are other food banks that could do with support in our region, for example, the Banbury Community Project. Um, Mark's obviously got a, a vested interest as a director of the CIC. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned the Trussell Trust stats at the start um, because they're the national stats, but actually we do work with local food banks and, uh, and indeed we created a fund of £50,000 last year to support around 70 local um, food banks. And, and I'm actually surprised that Banbury wasn't included in that um, because we would love to work with local food banks. So if you're not, if you're not part of our setup, then um, get in contact with our uh, community team here at Warwick and, and they will certainly get you involved um, so it's great to hear Thanks Mark and a question come through from um, Sharni again, um, Phil mentioned working closely with neighbouring cooperative societies learning from them and working together more effectively is there a forum we could join or create for similar departments and roles to collaborate yeah, I mean, I think we are we're doing more in this area. I mean, obviously, at the senior level, we work very closely, and, and actually, in various teams, I know that um, our food operations team have spent quite a bit of time working with you know neighbouring societies, Central England, uh, Southern Co-op, understanding some of the things they've been doing, sharing what we've been doing. So that's already happening. Um, so I think Shaney, you know, if you've got um, some ideas around that and you know you want to get access to those societies that that can happen it's it's you know it, we've just got to be careful around 
um, what information we share because the the regulators, the competition market authorities, um, you know, they see us as, as um, different businesses and therefore you've always got to be careful about what you share. But where you're sharing uh, to improve your operations, to make things better for customers, more efficient, then they're usually quite supportive of that type of approach. So, um, yeah, just, just um, you know, to talk, to, talk to John Street. He's, uh, um, he's the best person to talk to. <laughs> he can connect you. Thanks, Phil. And if members can bear with us for a couple of minutes more, I understand we'll, we'll be moving forward on the voting. Um, we've got a lovely comment there from Julie um, as a heartfelt thank you for donations uh, to Wolverhampton's Isles Cafe um, that they've received from Mid-Counties Co-op in the last 12 months in readiness for when we start our activities again later in this month. Um, and a question from Lee. Um, do you believe your co-op brand is clear enough for members to understand the... the your co-op brand is clear enough for members to understand the independence. There is a common misunderstanding that the co-op is the co-op. So does this help to clear up the confusion? Well, just before I answer that question, Julie, I absolutely loved my visit to Wolverhampton House Cafe, um, which was probably a year and a half ago, and I sat talking to a gentleman called David. I don't know if he still visits. He was in his 80s, and it was a brilliant conversation, and I love the work you do, and we are delighted to support you. Um, Lee, you know, I, I think your co-op is part of the Mid-Counties Co-Operative. We're quite clear about that, and we're not going to... Um, you know, there's always a... Um, there's always a difficulty in terms of how you promote your businesses through a consistent approach and then what your name is, um, you know, in the same way that Kingfisher, who own uh, B&Q and uh, Screwfix and businesses have got the same sort of thing. But for us, I think um, we're quite clear that, you know, we want people to understand that your co-op is part of the Mid-Counties Cooperative. That's why it says it on our website. Um, that's why it will say it in our food stores when we apply the your co-op branding and in our other businesses as well. But um, I, 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 do, I do. I take your point. I think there's more for us to do in this area. I think there's still some work to be done, and I think Alison um, knows that and uh, is looking that with our with our um, other members of the exec. Okay, thanks for that, Phil. Um, the next question come through is about um, looking to open businesses in any other sectors in the future. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a matter for the board, so, <laughs> because yeah, um, because obviously um, I think. I think there are areas where co-op could get involved that co-ops are not involved today, and I think there's, you know, certainly that's been a sense in the board. We've been quite careful because clearly we had some, you know, we, to get stability after the energy um, business, some of the course we got into, and I think that was important for us. Um, we, we, you know, we want to ensure that we can provide products and services to our members which are relevant to them in their day-to-day -day, that help them in their lives, and therefore that does open up the opportunities. And uh, there are some, there is some work being done at the moment to look at some opportunities that would further enhance that um, in terms of business area, but probably ones that fit with our existing businesses and expand their proposition perhaps more than that. But I know the board are keen to have some. Um, some blue sky sessions, as they're called, and that will probably ignite some new ideas and new options that will be sent away to look at. Um, so yes, we should always be open-minded to that. You know, and I, and I guess if members feel that there are area, particular areas um, that we'll, we can look to expand on our services, we'd be interested to hear from them. Absolutely. I mean, it's about you know how can we help you in your day-to-day -day lives, and um, you know, in in a way that perhaps others aren't doing it very well or doing it openly and um you know as a cooperative we want to make sure it's transparent and there's no um you know there's no small print um that we're hiding behind we have the results so i won't go to phil i'll come to edward our society secretary who's going to talk us through the outcome of the voting thanks edward i could just confirm from a slightly nervous back office that everything's worked properly uh, and all votes have been passed uh, by the required um percentages so the Special meeting rule changes needed a 66, well, two thirds majority, and the others just a simple majority, but all votes were passed with at least 90% of members voting in favour. So, good news. Thank you. Okay, and those full results will be available? Yeah, we'll publish the full results. You may actually be able to see them on your screen. It's on the left hand on side. On the left hand side, on the yellow ribbon down the left hand side, there's a button results. If you press on those, they'll all be there. Okay, thanks, Edward. 
Okay. So there's been there's been further questions, but I'm conscious of time. We have held members, so there'll be all the questions that have been asked. There's nothing specific being raised under any other business um, that um, for the members. So um, that brings our formal AGM to a close. I hope that you found the last couple of hours both informative um, and given you some opportunities, some thoughts about how you might engage with with us um, and your society. Um, I can let you know that a short feedback survey will be coming your way very soon. It's just to say that our half yearly meetings will be held in October. Perhaps we'll be able to meet in person, who knows. Um, and we're also have been delighted to have been nominated for leading co-op of the year. Please vote for us. Um, so it just leaves me to say thank you for taking the time to attend and have a good evening. Thank you.